Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Cincinnati School Board Finance Committee meeting. Uh, and we welcome everybody uh, to this meeting. And we have a large agenda. Towards the end of the agenda, we will be going into executive session. Uh, and we will move our agenda, the other item, if you will, at the end of our agenda, we'll move that up a notch so that once we go into uh, executive session, um, we will be able to uh, suspend and end our uh, committee meeting for the public. So again, welcome. And we have members Ryan Messer and also Melanie Bates uh, in attendance. So we have a full house of our committee members and the administration. And we'll begin right away with a, uh, a shortened and but posted update on some of the monthly financials. And Kevin, that's you. Thank you very much. Good to be with you guys. Um, so just quickly, as she mentioned, the report has been posted. Just two things I want to highlight, some um, anomalies this month. Um, the tax, so we received a couple tax advances in January. Um, and one of the larger ones came at the very end of the month. And so as part of just timing, it actually didn't get posted until February. So when you look at the graphs, you'll see the revenues number is down, but that's because about a large amount, 47 million was shifted to February. Um, and also our, our second foundation payment of the month was also done that way as well. So it's all footnoted on there. Uh, and if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out. The other big anomaly on expenditures is there was about $7 million of expense that was moved from the general fund over to the CARES fund, the 507. And so you'll see that in a footnote as well. But if you have any other questions um, at any time, then just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Do any members have any particular uh, questions, uh, not necessarily just from this report, but any other questions regarding the monthly financials? Just a point of clarity, Ms. Bolton, the tax Please. advances he was referring to was for property tax collections. Sorry, yes. And and there's a, thank you. And there's nothing. It was a matter of where it was located, right, or posted, or determined, just, it, or categorized. Just got booked in the February month of February, so February is going to look really big. <laughs> well, well, we look forward to that <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than anything looking short. So we appreciate it. If there's no other questions, uh, we'll move on then and we'll to our, our perennial guests uh, from Preschool Promise. We have Shara and Hector. And uh, I don't know which of you would like to start or what you would like to begin with. So you two take it away. Oh, I will start simply to clean up something from last month first. Uh, last month, I reported that the audit was in draft mode, and it now has been finalized, and it remained just like I reported last month. This is Clark Schaefer Hackett, who audited uh, CPP financials. It remained without any uh, adjustment, uh, so that's a good result. Uh, draft, as I reported last month, finalized now. Now, the... Second item I wanted to discuss that actually is before you, and that is the CPP forecast for the remaining of the year. Uh, as you can see, it has July through December is in actuals, and January through June is the forecast period. But I'll call your attention to the blue uh, or the column that has mostly blue in it, because blue sign uh, signifies an underspend. And if you look at the uh, bottom row, it'll show you that it's roughly about $2.7 million of underspend that we will have this year. If you remember when we were creating the budget, COVID was just starting and we did not fully understand. I would even venture to say even today we don't fully understand, but we certainly didn't understand a lot of the factors. Uh, that COVID uh, was going to impact. So therefore, we left the budget as we had originally done. If you look in the center of the page, the key differences by program area are explained, all of the significant moves. 
But really, the, uh, there are two items I'd like to call your attention to. First, just the size of the underspend that was caused, I would venture, with, um, by COVID going across our programs. So you have fewer children in school, right? So that means we pay less in tuition assistance than we expected. You have issues with the quality improvement programs themselves, because many of them closed momentarily or some of them closed even permanently, and so on and so forth down the line. So that's one item I wanted to call your attention, it's just the size and the underspend. The second one was that when we started, we actually were talking between the district and CPP about having to dip into the carryover funds we've been carrying because both of us were going to be spending significantly and we might need to dip into those. It turned out this year was not the year for that, but we suspect that as we get vaccines rolled out, as parents and children all start to come back and, and teachers and so on, maybe next year when we generate the next budget will be the time for that. Now, those were on a financial side, the points I wanted to make on an operational side, I think Chara can talk a little bit more about those that we are actually hitting our operational targets because those targets were adjusted for COVID. Even though the budget was not, the targets for operational purposes were. But before I, I turn it over to her, I just wanna make sure, are there any questions uh, on the financials for me? Do board members have any questions or comments? Bates or uh, Mr. Messer? Okay. Uh, and maybe that. I'll maybe I'll say uh, what I was going to be asking. I'll wait till Shara is finished because I I do have a couple of I don't know that they're financial, but they they the kind of financial slash operational. So Shara, if you want to go ahead. Uh, uh, that would be uh, I'll great. just flip the next slide then, please. Yes. Sure. So I think as I shared with you all um, last night and as Hector um, explained, we made our shifts in our operational targets when the Board of Managers approved our goals rather than making the shift in the budget in a time of uncertainty. So that's why when you see our dashboard, we are on track because we knew more. We got smarter by the time we made those deliverables and goals to be on track. On the next slide, when you see what's on our dashboard, there are certain areas that we know um, were critical in that underspend that Hector talked about TA, he talked about QI, but also in staff support fund, which you'll see on the dashboard is one of our yellow areas, which is direct funding for our QI provider thing, recruitment and retention. Um, we hope that that is going to, you'll see a spike in that, but that is an additional expenditure that is within the forecast. At the March board meeting for our board of managers, we'll be presenting some new ideas that um, aren't currently in the forecast in terms of innovative projects that we think um, may be forthcoming in times of a, a pitch night to have people bring ideas and services for providers and families that they think is gonna drive kindergarten readiness and support education. We'll be asking the board for an additional investment in supporting family engagement and family learning tools. Um, that was one of the priorities set by the board and we'd like to do that by supplementing the learning that's happening in the classroom, um, knowing that in some cases that's sporadic because of COVID and using electronic devices and things that we talked about like mindful musical moments, ABC mouse, ready Rosie and learning through art to help advance that as well. We'll also be proposing um, an extended learning side last year to help our four-year-olds make sure they're on track and ready and catch up if needed and opening that to three-year-olds as well so that they can use those extra classroom face-to-face -face time in those months to make, make sure they're ready for kindergarten. We also have, as I talked about last night, a kindergarten transition strategy that we'll be pushing forward as well um, at the last board of managers meeting. And we also um, initiated a new pilot where we chose seven quality improvement providers that are on track to reach high quality within the next six months. They have met all of their deliverables. They had a recommendation for their coach. They're simply waiting. 
a review by ODJFS to get that star movement and that allowing those providers to be a part of our TA program earlier. Um, we hope to reach additional students that we know are income eligible um, in the district and need to get that tuition assistance. So we will see what the impact will be with that small select group of providers. So that's kind of a snapshot in terms of operations, in terms of what we think uh, may be an effective use of some of those resources. Great, thank you. Um, does any board members have any questions or comments? Roshara? Nope. I, uh, you know, I, I would have more probably if we hadn't had the meeting last night. Uh, we're going to have a nice update. So that was uh, good timing. I know we're like doubly informed today, so it's, <laughs> that's great. Uh, let me ask a, just a, a question, and, and, and I'm coming off of another, like Mr. Messer, coming off of another meeting. Um, I know that we know that CPS is planning a, a major effort in the summer, uh, certainly K-12 uh, for sure. And I'm, I'm interested, uh, there's a real sense philosophically about we really need to be doing something very heavy duty in the summer to be able to start as strong as we possibly can, 21-22. And I just want, I know you went over some of it, but where are you all in trying to uh, infuse greater money, uh, more uh, effort, um, expansion, whatever, uh, regarding the summer piece so that when we open the traditional school year, we, we try to address some of the gaps that we have. Uh, what is your thinking along those lines? Tara? So our thinking is doing an, again this year at what we call the extended learning session. Um, and that is from um, in July and August up to the time that school starts. We did one last year. We had about 373 students participate. Um, we are going to try to line that up as carefully as we can with uh, Vera Brooks and her team so that everybody knows that the intense session in the summer is designed to make sure that kids are as ready as already approached us and started to ask about it. I think our learnings from last year is that we were concerned that we may not have enough resources to do it for all children, so we limited it to four-year-olds to prioritize it first. For That was a logistical nightmare for many providers, right, yeah. to say four-year-olds first and then three-year-olds. Because we have sufficient resources and we think the need is there because attendance hasn't been consistent, we're going to open it to all eligible students. The caveat for us is we have to make sure when we're budgeting that and planning that, that we don't exceed for a family what is the maximum allowed two years of tuition assistance payment for high quality preschool because we don't want to create a situation where families take an advantage of the extended learning session in two summers to get ready, but then they don't have sufficient tuition assistance to complete the regular academic year in February, March of 2022, right? So we have to make sure in how we target it to families, checking to see the families that we currently have enrolled, um, what the duration has been for them to make sure that we don't go over that cap. So we're, we're planning on it. Providers have been requesting it. Families in our year three evaluation said they loved it. They think it helped their children. It was really important to them. The operational piece is what we have to make sure we get straight so that we don't have a oops at the end that has a negative impact on the family. And I know two board meetings ago, Mr. Messer asked of, our, of the CPS folks about preschool in the summer. Uh, and, and so if indeed there's any of that, whatever's going to happen with preschool promise folks and perhaps CPS folks, that's all going to be hopefully coordinated. Is that the intention or the hope? Okay. That is the all intention, right. always coordinated. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That was sort of a softball question the way I asked it. Uh, you almost have to answer it that way. But um, I know, too, for uh, President Jones, uh, the issue is since uh, we are you know, trying to arrange a, a, a dual board meeting uh, together, uh, and since we did not have to dip into the carryover, uh, is does the this Preschool Promise uh, Board of Managers uh, have um, do you, what's the status of what was going to be the mutual resolution regarding carryover? 
Are, are you still pursuing that? Is there still interest in that? Or is there uh, no longer uh, interest in it since we didn't have to at the time, but now we do? Right. I, I think the, the board remains interested in that. Um, I will say the way that we left it is that uh, the preschool promise board side had approved it and we were we're just delaying discussion for consideration by the CPA. It, be, it may be a good opportunity um, to bring it up for discussion at the joint meeting. And there were some questions raised at our executive committee, um, particularly about the portion that was set aside in case the levy was not successful for the final year of implementation. Right. So and I think that would be if I could ask one more question, um, is there are you all working through some sort of pilot that uh, move some of the um, uh, availability to one and two stars? We are. Or that is the provisional. Yes, that is the provisional tuition assistance pilot that I mentioned. And those are one and two stars, again, that have received all of their equipment and materials. They are on track for three to five. They're through their coaching plan. So for all intents and purposes, they're just waiting on an ODJFS review and approval to reach that three to five five star okay it is only a select group that was selected that was on track and recommended by the coaches and the plan is not that they would receive the same rate as a current three four or five star that was equalized but a reduced rate comparable to what used to be given for the three star providers and they have to reach the prediction is that they have to reach that within six months and so we've had provisional status in the organization before when we started we know if we have a multi-site and a new site or classroom is added to that multi-site, then they are granted provisional status at the star rating that any anybody else in that site has. So when we put a lens on it on an equity issue to say, if you're a single site, you may never have that advantage. If we know we're trying to meet more kids that we know are in that site, we tried it before, but there were not enough chucks and balances on it because we had sites that went an entire year that we had anticipated would move up to stars and didn't quite achieve it. We think with these new controls in place by recommendations for the coach, the small six month window for controls for the pilot, it is again for a select small group. We anticipated this maximum spend for those students would be about 130,000. And there are seven to 10 providers that have been selected to be in the pilot cohort. Thank you. Uh, Treasurer Wagner, do you have any questions or members, do you have any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. I'm good. Cool. We just met earlier in the yeah. week, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Well, but we sometimes messages need to be repeated, I guess. But I appreciate the presentation today. Hector or Shara, do you have any questions for any of us or for or Jen? Or have you completed what you needed to do today? I think we're oh. done. We just always say thank you for the partnership. Um, you make our job and our work easy by being good partners, and every member of the CPS team does that. And we're really looking forward to saying, how do we continue to kind of enrollment? And what you mentioned before, Ms. Bolton, really trying to understand where are the children that we haven't reached? Um, and we think that many of those are with our QI providers. And so oh. part of the pilot program is also to say, how many children are we really serving by helping those QI providers get to high quality? Because there are two things that we do. We serve through tuition assistance, but we also serve through quality improvement. And if those children are there, we still need to start recognizing those as the impact that we're having. And that is part of what we'll be doing with our year four evaluation with innovations as well. So we're pleased to have them on board. Um, we know they do lots of work for CPS as well and monitoring data and what happens and the benefit of that partnership, we hope will generate some really um, concrete data. So we know where we are as we go into renewing our master agreement, we go into the next phase of expenditures of preschool expansion for the levy that we really know clearly what our targets are and can really share truly how many children we're helping. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Messer. I didn't know if you saw my hand, but I had it up. Um, I don't know if probably maybe it wasn't in your view, but you know, I think we got a great update yesterday. Um, but you know, I do think it's going to be great for us to get the teams back together for a little bit more of that future planning, um, because you know, I know we have some uh, deserts that we'd like to proactively fill, and my question is, are are we 
how, how can we work together to, and making sure that that's all happening to get you know access to where people um, live and work um, and so I think some of that longer plan stuff uh, I, th I think will be great to do that with our boards together I think that's a great suggestion and maybe um, if uh, Ms. Bruckner can do this uh, for next month's meeting maybe uh, the preschool promise folks and, and our own uh, folks uh, like uh, Vera will be able to maybe at least help us, and this is part of the whole growth plan too that you're you're talking about, uh, to kind of update us on where we think those deserts are, which ones maybe we've been fortunate enough to to eliminate, and which ones we're now focusing on. I think that would help CPS and help Preschool Promise as well, because that was part of the the, the commitment we made to the public as well. I appreciate it, and you are in my my um, uh, little panacea here, Mr. Messer, so <laughs> feel free to just yell out. That's great. Melody, you good? I, Perfect. Okay. Oh, I have sorry. to say, Go ahead. what I think will be crucial in that assessment is that there is a, um, a forthcoming report from 4C for Children that looks at the complete providers in Hamilton County, which, you know, overlaps with the CPS footprint that's going to tell us um, between 2019 and 2020 with a focus on who's accepting publicly funded child care and the number of seats we've seen move in and out of the system, the providers we've seen it move in and out of the complete system in Hamilton County that I think will give us a good snapshot of, of where we are in terms of quality gap neighborhoods because that's the extra layer that we need. It's not only providers that may be there, but providers that are accepting publicly funded child care and our preschool promise partners that serve our eligible family. Yeah, and if, if I could, uh, yeah, let me just let me ask this real yeah. quick. It's a, just an agenda issue. I've heard about this uh, uh, report or the study. It, will it be completed by this next month when we meet, or should we delay that discussion until it is uh, is completed, Shara? I, I think it would be helpful for us to delay the discussion. I will get an update yeah. from 4C. It was my understanding that that may be released before the end of February. Um, but I also know as things change with pressing priorities that they have to serve providers in 14 counties, that may change as well. Um, but I think that would be invaluable information that we wouldn't have to go recreate and get if we have that right. reported information as well along with what um, Eric Rademacher is helping us work on from UC, who was one of the authors of the original RAND report, as well as the work of Innovations is doing it. So I have no problem in moving forward to keep Vera updated on the status of that release so that as soon as the data is ready, um, she can let you know so that it can be added to the agenda. But I, I think the discussion is worthwhile any time, but to have a more informed discussion, I think that report would be very helpful. Great. Well. Take that into account, Ms. Bruckner, and we might, but we might not uh, have it for the next month, but uh, we'll keep uh, apprised of that. Mr. Messer, sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no. I mean, uh, my only other thing was, you know, as we think about forward planning, um, kind of as we were in the discussion at the last meeting, just about school funding in general, I think we're all hopeful with new leadership nationally that there may be additional dollars coming into early childhood. So I, I'd be interested in having that as like a discussion topic to see probably some of you are much closer to what that looks like than me. Uh, but I'd love to know what's kind of happening at the national level related to this and how that might be able to help fuel our growth. Maybe it'll help us uh, uh, right size some compensation uh, and a variety of things in these centers and make it more of a, a priority if we're seeing that come down from Washington. So I'd love to maybe get a almost like a legislative update of what we can expect to see in the weeks and months ahead for planning purposes. I think that's a great idea, and I think Preschool Promise people will be in good touch with that. And then also uh, uh, you all in um, health and safety can address that to our liaison folks for sure. And uh, maybe Treasurer Wagner can kind of be following. Um, she's always on the hunt for additional revenue and <laughs> early hints as to where there might be some more money. So I think that's a great thing. Let's think about that. And I know there's a tremendous interest in stuff that's shovel ready for facilities mm -hmm. and technology. So it'd be great to be shovel ready. And certainly that would impact the, the private providers as well as us. So uh, let's, let's, this is, 
keep a strong interest in all of that. Anything else for us? Good report. Thank you. And now, uh, Treasurer Wagner, you're going to do three things uh, right in a row. You're going to do the COVID impact, uh, ODE response letter, and an update on CARES Act. Rob, <laughs> can you yeah. bring the PowerPoint up, please? <laughs> Talking to myself. That's all right. Good company. <laughs> all right, you can keep flip to the next slide. So here is a here's a summary of all the different grants or funding sources we've received related to COVID. Um, and what I'm showing you here is what we've actually spent, what's been encumbered through purchase orders. And then the committed money uh, represents what's committed through payroll, because we're not going to um, move that money to something else. So I've added all that together and, and show you here. So the big CARES Act money, um, <clears throat> we've spent almost 16 million, and uh, we have about seven million that's unallocated. At this point, this money expires in September of 30 of 22, so we have time to deal with this. We actually had more spent out of this grant, but as the other grants popped in, we started, and they had a shorter time frame, we started moving monies between the, to maximize our refunds. Um, the CRF came, that's the Coronavirus Relief Fund, that came later. Um, it originally was supposed to expire in December, and then they extended it. And so we just have very little monies left there to allocate. The Broadband Connectivity Fund is already complete. It was expired in December. It was only $150,000. <clears> and then the Hamilton County, they couldn't spend all their CARES Act, so they gave us a very short window to spend money. And um, and that, the rules were so tough to fulfill, we could only prove $1.2 million of qualifying expenses that had already been paid out. So a lot of our CARES Act stuff were um, – encumbered or committed but hadn't been paid yet or incurred yet so we couldn't use those um, but 1.2 million helped a lot um, so we have about seven million dollars as of february 12th to um, figure out how how we're going to allocate it i have some plans so um, if you go to the next slide rob ooh, the alignment came terrible okay yeah. these are just kind of the um highlights I, the big pit ticket items of things that we've hit for this year, right? So we had the expansion of nurses. We used this uh, student wellness fund. Technology expense, that was the $7 million that Kevin referred to earlier. It was in the general fund, and we moved it from the general fund into CARES Act to help reduce that budget uh, reduction that we were looking for. The Cincinnati Digital Academy's budget increased by $5 million since last year because of the number of staff and resources. And remember, we just approved a $800,000 then and now invoice for the licensing software for their curriculum <clears throat> for the first semester. Um, unemployment was an unanticipated expense, $2 million, and a million hit the general fund, and we put a million dollars in CARES Act. Um, I think I explained this rule before, but it, it warrants re-explaining. So one of our employees has a second job, and they get laid off. They got laid off through COVID of that second job. Both employees cost allocate and share in the unemployment costs, even though we we had nothing to do with their layoff. It's so in, incredibly unfair, but it's really skyrocketed our unemployment. Um, the super subs is now in the general fund and school wide pool, and that's something that we're looking at to move into the CARES Act now that we have some room to spend. Um, <clears throat> the retirement payouts. So we had more people retire than we had anticipated. So our budget went up about a half a million dollars this year so far. Um, the leave pool went up. Uh, the budget increased by about $3 million. So we had a bunch more people go out on leave that we were paying their sick leave, but then we were having to pay the teacher to cover that classroom. Um, the safety pairs, if you recall, um, when, they, when the staffing team went through TAC and and did their analysis, they, they held on to 58 paraprofessionals to help with the safety protocols in the buildings for bus monitoring and temperature checking and social distancing in the hallways and whatnot. <clears throat> so that was an $850,000 budget, and we're looking to move those over to CARES as well. 
go back. There you go. And that page we talked about intervention specialists. Oh, here's can you scroll up a little bit, Rob? Won't scroll. Here I can just tell you what it says. <clears throat> so one thing I went and captured. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. Um, one thing I, I captured was an increase in charter tuition that is a direct result of COVID, right? So because we were closed or going hybrid, parents withdrew. So our charter school tuition went up uh, $900,000 and EdChoice went up $1.4 million. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, we have about $6 million in cleaning, PPE, and the curricular supplies, you know, ready-to-go kits and those kinds of things. Our crisis communication. Um, uh, it was a body, brook, and a whole bunch of efforts of documents that had to be communicated out. <clears throat> so that's about $37 million just this year. And I, what I realized is I need to go back and capture what we paid out in fiscal year 21 and add that to the total. So I'll work on that for next month. And I'll just keep this slide updated. <clears throat> okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, before I start talking about this, I'll do the CARES Act 2 really quickly. Um, the, our allocation is around $93 million, assuming that they don't change it on us. Um, it is, we have until September of 23 to pay down on it. So, and the initial conversations that we're having um, is paying for the extra summer recovery work, extended day, you know, helping our kids get back on track. Um, we did hear that we can use preschool. We can, we can use it to support preschoolers in summer school. So that was good news. Um, and the next thing I want to look into is, could it help us with some of our capital facility issues? We'll see. So I'll let you know about that too. But um, as soon as the summer recovery plans get finalized and costed out, is um, I'll bring it back to Finance Committee and we'll just use a running total of how we're going to plan to use that CARES Act money. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for the current budget. So you remember the student projections, um, we use October's numbers to try to get back, retain, retain, remarket our kids back to the district. And so because we were using those that were used to right size the staff this year, we rolled over the school staff for next year with some modifications for Cans and Gamble and Spencer, schools that were growing grade levels who would need more bodies. Um, also, they're looking at the seventh bell. Well, how many bodies it's going to need to go, go back to the seventh bell um, schedule. <clears throat> so then we just had the board workshop. And so PLT worked this week to um, put some communications together. I've held three principal budget Q&A, virtual Q&A sessions. And then we met with all the directors and principals today to talk about strategy. So OpenGov opens tomorrow for everybody to start entering their uh, their budget asks. The schools are focusing on their one plans and their map and assessment scores um, as a measured against the strategic targets. And the DSLs are going to help them through that process. The central office um, are going to take the board strategies and create their PGSMs, if you recall that document from last year. Um, and we're continuing to use the mission margin matrix to determine um, what's the highest impact with the lowest cost. Sarah Trimble Oliver and I um, worked through a, a doc, it's a tool that we created back when I was a CIO to determine what technology, pro technology projects we wanted to fund. And so we came up with this decision matrix with weighted questions and it, it helped us to determine which the highest priorities were. And we're going to try to use it for this um, budget cycle because, you know, in 27 and a half years with the district, the budget ask is never less than the budget target. We're always having a pair back. So this will help us maybe um, strategize on how the best way to determine those priorities. So budgets are due um, to be submitted in OpenGov by March 19th. And then um, that's when the PLT will start working on the consolidation and the reviewing and the balancing. And then we'll use um, April and May to do the public engagement and get a board adoption on June 30. I don't ever want to have to do a temporary appropriations again. <laughs> that was quite a challenge. So um, any questions on the current budget? 
Melanie or Ryan? You look like little postage stamps, so I can't see you if you raise your hand. So, um, okay, so I do. flipping. I do. Oh, go Ryan ahead. Sorry. Has a question. Yeah, um, I, I think maybe it, you could probably help me figure this, but I'm struggling with how we do any sort of budgeting without a student projection model. Um, and, you know, we were asked the question by the superintendent at our retreat, and if we were, if we were basically, hey, do you want to take right or do you want to take, take a left? You know, we were given kind of, we're not sure which way to go. And I said, well, are we, do we want to expand or whatever? And I think that's all based on what do we think is going to happen with our students? Right. And um, I, I, you know, we all get in the letters. Um, I've heard that. Elder uh, has such a backlog of CPS kids. I've got uh, friends on the board of St. Mary's. They're talking an expansion. And so I don't I don't know what the real numbers are. We got kind of got a general report, you know, and I raised those questions. It was not publicly presented. Um, I think we need to go back to what does our reality look like? What have we lost? And, you know, mm -hmm. and I know, like, since I was on finance before, you know, the pa it's not a pass-through anymore, correct? Um, correct. Well, what's um, not a pass-through? Well, that that money wasn't coming to us, and then we paid it out to the charter, and... Oh, it is still a pass-through. Yeah. Okay, it is. Yeah. And it was disproportionate, right? Still is. <laughs> and so, yep. And so, you know, when people are saying, oh, so you lose a few students. Oh, no, this is a big deal. And you mm -hmm. start to multiply, you know... I think the one school had a hundred down. Yeah. I think this is part of the conversation we have to have that, you know, these changes affect the overall financial stability of the district long term. And yes. I think the CARES Act dollars are like, a, like, what if we didn't have those? We would have right. some significant cuts, I'm afraid. So my question is, how do we do budgeting without knowing um, – what additional students we think we're going to lose based on, you know, doing some focus groups and research. And, you know, we've had to do kind of a moment in time at my uh, job to, based on what we know, here's what we think projected sales are going to be. I got to think that we can do the same thing. Here's what we think projected students based on these variables. And we've heard from this audience of t parents, if we have five days back at Walnut, at least in some sort of plan by August, we should retain this many. If we don't mm -hmm. have a plan, we stand to lose this many. I think we should be able to answer some of those questions, put it into a model, and then I think it would inform our budget um, versus kind of I think the 93 could make us say, well, we can cover a lot with that. So that's kind of part one. The other question I had on here was, you know, regardless if we lose 100 or 150, 200 students at Walnut, we still are overcrowded. So is that project able to be funded with CARES Act dollars? Well, that's what I was just saying. I was going to look into if we could use that $93 million to help with some of our capacity facility issues. That's okay. what I was referring to. Got it. But okay. So, All right. so my intent is not to use the $93 million to support current operations because okay. all that money is going to come back to the general fund. So we really want to use this money to go above and beyond, supplement what we're doing to get the kids back on track. Now, that's just then, Jim's opinion, right? And then the second part of that then, um, you know, obviously building onto Walnut, and I think so many people missed that this board was already hot on that trail and had multiple presentations before the pandemic hit. So that mm -hmm. has been interesting for a lot of people. They're like, oh, I guess you weren't asleep at the wheel, which I heard several right. times. Um, but the question is, could those dollars, I think, could it be used not for capital, but to cover space or a field of trailers in one of the, in the football field or whatever it takes to get enough room to get our kids back even at three feet full time? Could those funds be used for that, I guess, in addition to the capital when you're asking? All right. And then um, I, I will research that. Was my plan to research that and get back to you? But. So let me circle back to the student thing again because and then mm -hmm. before you circle before you circle back, Jen, uh -huh. yeah. uh, to take up to take up uh, uh, Ryan's point about enrollment, you'll recall a couple of months ago, an enrollment report was uh, presented that presented two directions. 
Uh, And one direction was to look at our current enrollment, which is significantly less than it previously has been, and budget for that. And indeed, the board was asked, do we want to uh, uh, organize around uh, the district enrollment uh, at uh, 2019 when we were still in a growth pattern, or are we going to decide to enroll based upon our de- declining enrollment, which has occurred this year. And I, I, I don't think everybody we got to take a vote or anything. My position was it would be best to organize around where we were growing and, and keep, if you will, that kind of number, which was 36.366 versus going with 35.261. And that way you have more staff uh, and keep the staff level, the rollover level, and then that way you can look at smaller classes, you're in a better position to grow. So, I mean, uh, I think Ryan's right that we need to focus more on that enrollment decision. But I think we also have to have you all come back to the board after that March 18th time to see if where you all have gone is where we um you know was the shore we were thinking about uh, to build that in before we go to the uh, community engagement in april and and uh, march but my vote is to to figure enrollment based upon the the 2019 and then to keep the staff that we've got now so i i interrupted you and i know melanie has a, a point before uh you respond jen yeah i'm not i mean i'm all for keeping the higher number because if our kids leave and go to charters and vouchers, we're going to have to pay out more. So that makes sense. But keeping our staffing up doesn't make sense, especially if that's the case and that's where we're headed. So at what point in this budget cycle do we have uh, room for uh, RIFs and non-renewals? And then one other comment. I think this is one that almost we could have at these meetings each time we meet because uh, I don't know. know, My kids obviously are in high school, but I'm hearing that uh, lots of people are making those decisions for the parochial schools right now. now. And and the expectation Mm -hmm. is we will see an impact after that period. And I don't think it's going to go in the – it's not going to continue to grow. I think it's going to continue to decrease. Um, as we aren't open, um, r- whether you think it's okay or, or you know, we should be in school or not be in school, that's the reality. A lot of families are leaving to get their kids in full time, and I think we owe that number to the public to show you know what's happening because that obviously ladders to our overall uh, funding and economic stability. Okay, so hey Rob, can you take the slide down so we can see faces, please? Thank you. Um, Okay, so let me circle back. So, we, so we do have a model that we do student projections for, right? And it's fairly accurate at the district level, like in the 99% range. Um, if we drop the lower enrollment into that model, it would continue to produce a, a bigger decrease, and we would have had significant layoffs already. While there's a team that's out there doing this marketing to get these kids back, right? They're trying to recruit these kids back. They're doing the application cycles now. Um, so they went with the higher number, not the highest number, not the one, not the 36,000, but what we had in October, because that's what we right sized to this year. So if we went to the 36,000 this year, we would be hiring a lot of people right now that we're not sure we're going to need. And then we'd have to turn around and pull um, offers. Having said that, the, I think there was a commitment to review the data in the spring after they've done all this analysis and then uh, reevaluate where this, the, the status. So we couldn't wait for that analysis to happen because the collective bargaining agreements makes us surplus people by February 15th. And then they have their transfer rounds on March 1. So um, they did what they could in the window that they had it without causing too much pain and heartache to people unnecessarily. They were afraid if they laid off a whole bunch of people, they'd have to turn around and hire them back again, and that would be a, a nightmare. And then they're afraid if they hire too many people, they'd have to turn around and lay those people off. 
um, back to the higher number. So then, then the projection it drives our staff, not the charter school in tuition. So the um, the key is going to be what's the balance between who's where enrolled and where we're going to shift those funds to. Um, and this is a weird year, and nobody's able to come up with any level of comfort what student projection, what our student enrollment is going to be like next year. And so, and remember, all these decisions were done before vaccines were promised and all that kind of stuff. So there was always a plan to re-review things to figure out where we were mm -hmm. going. Uh, and I agree with you 100 percent. They should be talking to the schools to figure out how to get these kids back, knocking on doors, you know, um, because this that if these kids don't come back, it has a negative impact on some of our other funds, like our student wellness money is going to drop. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Leslie, who sits on our team now, is reporting the application traffic. So I think. Um, I can't remember what she said yesterday off the top of my head about how many applications we already have already for the magnet enrollment and the lottery is just kicking off. So the high school lottery is just kicking off. <clears throat> um, so I don't disagree with what anybody's saying. It's the best information they had at the time and the window that they had to do that with without eviscerating all the school staff. You're on mute. Thanks. I, I again want to go with betting on growth because if we don't bet on growth, we're in deep trouble. It took us how many years to get in a growth mode? And indeed, we have to get back to that growth mode. And I think if you have even in, in opposition to what Mel's saying about the, the number of staff, we know that COVID and post COVID is requiring more staff than we ever needed to have before whether it's support staff or whether it's instructional staff. We know that our classes need to be smaller in not only COVID, but post COVID. So I think there's a justification, but I, I do think that that review that you're talking about does need to happen with the full board uh, sometime in March, just to see yep. the direction. But yep. I, would, I, would, I would also say though, that the administration and this board better be able to come up basically on the anniversary of when we all had to get out of town, we better have a plan that promises the community that we are back for next school year and this fourth quarter. If we don't have a plan, because that's what people are now talking about, they're talking about will you be, will you be functioning, will you be able to do five days next year? If we don't have a plan that we actually announce and put forward, as a positive growth thing and we're back, it's our programming. The reality is we're not going to grow and it's going to take us three years to get back on a growth plan or we'll never get back on a growth trend. So I think this is a pivotal time on, on messaging as well as the budgeting piece. And I really, I really feel strongly that we're going to have to do that. Got it. Other comments? Ryan? Yeah, and then, you know, so I agree with everything you just said. Um, as it relates to current state, again, going to our current enrollment, have we have we decided, you know, in that report I got, that we all got, it showed like, you know, one school down 100 and some or whatever. Did that then equate to we didn't need as many staff there? Or are you saying we just kept everybody, whether we need them or not, and we'll try to repurpose later? Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm hearing people like leaving, like neighbor pulled two kids, down mm -hmm. the street pulled a kid, over across the street and down the other side they pulled a kid, and it's all been like on our neighborhood. So what happens if, when those are aggregated? Are we making staffing choices there, or is it that we hold until we see what next year looks like? No, so typically in September is when we convert from projected enrollment to actual enrollment and they go through that TAC process, teacher alloc allocation committee, and they right size to whatever that is. Well, this year it was delayed because everything got delayed, right? So that TAC process actually happened in December. So as our enrollment dropped this year, they did reduce staff, mostly vacancies, um, and shifted people around. 
So that's why I said they right size to this year, and that's what we rolled over to start building next year's budget. Melanie? Yeah, well, I mean, the elephant in the room is that the board caused this exodus. Yes. And we can't separate this process from the board's voting patterns. If, right. If you, can even, if you can even call it a pattern. Uh, so this reality has to be brought to the full board as to whether or not the intent is to grow or to continue to push out people because of the votes of the board. If we would have followed the superintendent's recommendations, I don't think we would have been quite in the dilemma we are today. So the reality is the board did this, and so we need to move this to a full board discussion so they can make the connection between what the board did and what we're facing. And, because they, don't, they, they have no clue. They're talking no, about they're... six feet and you know safety of everybody's families in addition to our students. That's all they're talking about. But, uh, I'm gonna, because of the time frame, I'm hearing that we wanna continue this discussion this coming month. We are saying that we would like the board to have another opportunity to see what the administration's gonna come up with before it starts to be written in stone. And more particularly, um, we uh, have to make a decision about are we gonna grow or not grow? And we have to also make sure that the administration to everybody's point, comes up with the message that we are back at the end of this year and for next year, and we have to be able to compete. Nobody's gonna show up here if indeed the same sorts of, of, of concerns still exist. So if you can carry that back to the administration, Treasurer, that would be good because we have to move on to some other topics. But we wanna continue this discussion and we'll, uh, maybe mention to Carolyn that we need to have a discussion about this, the full so, board. And I'm Go happy ahead. to carry that message, but what can we do? What? How can I prepare or how can we prepare something to facilitate that conversation for you? What, like when and what, and what kind of information do you want? First, uh, the repeat of the direction one and direction two that we got, which was the starting point. The importance that I think all of our board members understand is the importance of scale in being able to even offer the services that we offer. That's something I learned from Mary Ronan. If your school is too small or mm -hmm. if your district is too small, you cannot, you, it's not a matter of funding. You can't staff. You can't do anything in the scale that you need to. We'll be back as we were 10 years ago when there wasn't art and music in every building. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is critical. And, and the reality is, it's, it's this anniversary coming up of the COVID thing where we need to also project a, a positive view and a reality of what, we, what we're planning on being able to do by fourth quarter and more particularly what we're able to do and planning next year. There's nothing okay. incremental about any of this. Ryan, right. did you have a, a comment? Yeah, and to Jen's question of like, what would we need, um, you know, it was sobering when our CFO presented to our leadership team what happened for every 1% market share we lost with our business mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for J&J. &J. And they said, so here's why we can't, because that 1% equals this amount of dollars, and it would come from human resources, so there would be a headcount reduction. We would lose our, you know, what we call our T&E dollars. We would lose this, and they kind of laid it out. So that we could say, well, what's the projection showing? Well, given current state, we stand to lose 3%. And it showed like, it spit out like, oh my God. And it really made people say, okay, we gotta stop. We can't have any drop. And it really <laughs> gave a sobering, you know, people like, okay, you know, it's okay. We can lose a market share point or whatever. Well, when they saw the output of that, it was, okay, this is a different conversation. People sat up straighter. And I think having a discussion that, you know, 1% of our market share or whatever that, or, or maybe for every 10 students we leave, lose or whatever, it equates to this downhill impact. Melody, do you have anything that you would be requesting? Well, that we consider the, uh, that, that we have a full board decision and, and we don't, we, we talk about the connection about 
you know, the decisions that have been made and the budget and do that in conjunction with the release of the criteria assignment that I requested. So we have the full picture of how, you know, yes, this has happened, you know, to move forward, we need this <coughs> and have a full re reconsideration. And right now what we're doing is, you know, taking the budget in isolation, taking safety in isolation, taking Walnut in isolation, but to have a comprehensive discussion uh, with all facets of how we move forward to grow instead of looking at the silos that we have been. There, there are only two board members out of seven that remember what it takes and what it took to stop the decline in enrollment, plateau the, 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 the enrollment, and then start on a growth trend. The, and this is, that is a nightmare if we have to start that over again. That's why I think that's how, Jen, if we could, we'll spend part of March having uh, maybe an engaging kind of board discussion as well as visioning what next year looks like, as well as a plan on fourth quarter that indeed, and I think there is going to be a majority unless something terribly, terribly happens regarding variants or whatever, that these kids are in school more than the blended time period uh, or, or cycle uh, by fourth quarter. I, th I think there's parts of Walnut that could return if we actually did an instructional program and we used the staff in a way that would work well. So let's uh, let's end this part of the discussion so we're able to keep with our time schedule. What else did you have, uh, Jen? Does this count as the CARES Act and the uh, yeah. OD response letter, or what does this count as? Oh, that was just the budget COVID stuff. And then, so just so you know that we have a budget redesign team that's working on the whole equitable distribution, and we'll keep you updated. It's in That'd writing. So, um, Rob, if you could just close that one and bring up the um, spreadsheet that I sent you last. It was for item number four. There you go. Okay, so in the ODE, so we got the letter, the uh, letter explaining the deficit. Um, that was in the third year of the five-year forecast. And so they, the letter says you just, because you show this cash deficit in fiscal year 23, you have to come up with a plan to close that deficit. And so when I spoke to the lady, she said, well, I told her we, that we'd re received notice of increased revenues because of the triennial update and then state foundation returning half the cut. Um, and she said, we could just redo, redo the forecast to show that difference. Oh, so what cool. I'm showing you is a summary of this. So the top section shows you the anticipated revenue in November, and then in February, based on the triennial update and the collection rate and the state funding, <laughs> we'll get nine million more in this year in revenue, four million in 22 and four million in 23. And we didn't do anything to the expenses; we just left the four the expenses the same. But you can see the resulting cash balances that will end this year with 70 million instead of 61. And then that carries forward and closes that deficit. So that will end February 23 with 5 million in cash, which we could spend sneezing. So, because it's <laughs> a pretty big budget. So I'm very cautious that we're <laughs> trying to tell everybody we're not, we cannot spend this money. We can't grow the target for next year. We cannot do this. So um, that's the update. And so we'll file that. Um, we'll try to get it in the 22nd board meeting for adoption, and then we'll file it with ODE and closes that loop. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thank so I'm done there. All right. Any questions on that? Sorry. No, it's good news. Yeah. I remember um, the days when we had to like list 14 things to make up the difference. They were I know, all things we had to cut. So, and then we didn't necessarily have to. After doing uh, 70 million in cuts, I was not looking forward to that conversation. Exactly, exactly. So uh, do you have any other things to report, Jen? No, I'm done. Before I uh, move to the transportation, let me ask uh, board members, Do uh, Jen and I went over the work plan, and I, I think you all received the red line. Did either of you uh, members have anything you wanted to change or move from the work plan? Um, we already have moved the liaison folks. 
uh, and more particularly, um, the uh, two thirds of that work plan, except the calendar part, is all pro is all bylaws, protocol, and strategic plan. So if the if you had anything that you wanted to change, it probably would have been in the month to month. But Jen and I did that already. Um, any suggestions or concerns? Thought it looked great. Yeah, All right. Great job. Yay for <laughs> us. I won't Yay. tell you where we. I won't tell you where we did that job, but that's all right. Uh, growth discussion. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, being such the nerd that I am, and Melanie will know this is true. I've kept a lot of notes. Little hard copy girl that I am, and I'll suspend <laughs> since we just started to talk about growth. I'm going to count what we just talked about, both preschool and what we just talked about as enrollment, as our growth discussion. But what I've done is I've put together as many of the various growth ideas, buildings, uh, programming, uh, consolidation, whatever, and I'll, I'll, I'll create that document for us to look at. But I think we just had a growth discussion. So I'm going to take that from uh, this uh, particular agenda item. And so what is then, uh, did anybody have any other items before we go to transportation? And even transportation can be short, shorter than usual. Any other topics that you wanted to make sure we talked about? A lot of news in this in this in this committee meeting today between preschool and this, and a lot of work for the full board to do. So that's great to hand it off to them. Okay, before we go into executive session, uh, for the uh, treasurer to share with us uh, her uh, evaluation tool, uh, we'll go to transportation for an update and to try to receive a little bit of information if we could. So is Mr. Johnson uh, with us, or Trimble Oliver with us, or not? Mr. Johnson's is. logged in. He's got the best set in the whole build in the whole district, except for Mrs. Uh, uh, Bowers or MSNBC uh, set when she does <laughs> remote. Mr. Johnson, let me uh, just start by asking a question: uh, uh, Did how did the MOU for the bus drivers subsidy, whatever we're calling that, can you update us on that that we agreed to go forward with? Yes, yeah, so the MOU is drafted. We had it reviewed by general counsel. It is being processed with signatures, and so we should have that on our books and records with the, the contracts. Okay. Uh, and then um, I know that we didn't have a consensus, and I'm probably the one most responsible for that not being a consensus on the uh, proposed extension by one year of the uh, various vendors, five or six vendors, if I recall correctly. That's correct. Can I, can I ask what the date is that you would have to know um, if the district has significantly changed in its prioritization of transportation or changed in some choice or uh, um, geographic arrangements. When, when, when's the date that you really need to have something signed and delivered? Since I know you want to delay, rightfully so, I think the big RFP. Right. Uh, I, I would say by April. Um, keep in mind our current contracts only take us out to June 30th, and with us planning to have a robust summer school learning experience this year. Come July 1, I won't have any contract right. to actually go off of. And so uh, that's why I'm saying April is the latest that we could really kind of push that out uh, just to make sure that the, the contracts and the extensions are are, are executed uh, through legal properly. That would be great. Is it possible that some could be extended as they are and others could be new? I mean, how does that figure in your, in your uh, planning? Uh, the ones that we are planning on being new would be the uh, our fuel contract. Um, I am working with purchasing on executing that RFP out the gate. Um, the one with Metro, we could possibly leave that as is. I could have a conversation with uh, Mr. Haley over at uh, Metro to see if we could just extend that one out as well or keep that current rate and, and structure as is. Our pricing model is our pricing model with Metro. So they are, you know, a not-for-profit uh, organization, so we don't have to run the risk of any inflated costs associated with a new contract. But you would need from the 
board or at least the board would have an opportunity to advise a superintendent. We don't decide this. So the superintendent decides and then tells you what what needs to be done based upon your expertise, uh, obviously. But if, if we could do it before the end of March, uh, what the district might look like or whatever, that would that's the latest, right? Correct. Right. And then that's just the caveat, just purely looking at summer school um, and being sure. able to have the resources for that. Right. Uh, Ryan or Melanie, do you have any questions or uh, Jen, do you have any questions for Mr. Johnson? Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. I, I'm just so in hopes that, again, on the anniversary of the COVID experience, this would also be part of uh, the, the the next CPS in part and not necessarily maintaining the status quo, although some things probably would need to just be extended, but maybe there's some room for some changes as well. Is that is that a fair way of putting it, Mr. Johnson? Well, that's, a, that's a fair way of putting it, and I would just leave with this little notion that a CPS student is a CPS student, whether or not they go to a non-CPS school, I will still be obligated to transport them. So there's really no change of funds um, for that, so. Excellent point. Yeah, and unfortunately we've been transporting more of those students than the ones yeah. that are coming to our buildings, which is also yeah. lending itself to much criticism by us, uh, from some people um, from about us. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Johnson, or if Sarah does, are we good? Um, no, if you guys need any information to help support the uh, decision-making process, please let me know, and I'll be right. uh, in providing that for you guys. Thank you so much. All right, Appreciate Thank it. Um, I think that takes care of us except the executive session. Um, so I'm not sure how the, who's managing how we do this. I know we'll need a um, motion to go into executive session for employment public uh, official, but I don't know if there's some, uh, how does this work tech wise? Ms. Bolton, what we'll do is we will, um, we will stop the meeting and then we will um, remove anyone who you do not deem necessary to be in the executive session from the private group. Um, and then um, Jeremy will probably stay on as a tech moderator, just Perfect. his machine, and we'll go from there. So as long as he doesn't mention the bridge, we'll, Jeremy can stay. We've got a lot of bridges ready for you. He's, he's ah, ready. All right. Always, always. Thank you. Um, the chair will uh, compliment everybody on the meeting. I think we had a lot of good stuff. And the chair will entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of employment of a public official, where we will be discussing the evaluation tool for the uh, treasurer. So Ms. Moved. Bates, thank you. So Second. Thank you, thank you. We will now go into executive session. Thank you, public, for joining us. And uh, uh, we'll keep only uh, Jeremy at uh, uh, working the screen, I guess it's called. I don't know. Thank you.